Hello everyone. With this episode I am starting a, a, a new chapter where we analyze uh, what's called Bayesian games or sometimes they're called uh, games with incomplete information. So in this episode I'm going to give you the intuition behind the uh, analysis of these games uh, and sort of how we approach to those games and then the next episodes I am going to describe formally what I am uh, sort of intuitively mentioning in this episode. Well, to give the intuition, uh, I'll, 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 I'll start with an example. And the example I'm going to consider is what's called uh, auction. So uh, the first auction I'd like to talk about is what's called English auction. You probably have heard of it, maybe not the name, the, the English auction, but it's actually one of the most famous ways of, uh, of, of selling or buying uh, items. So for example, you would like to buy a painting um, and, and the paintings, and, and let's suppose, by the way, this is a, a rare painting uh, auctioned in Sotheby's or some other auctioning house. Uh, well, what is the English auction? Well, the English auction is simple. The auctioneer uh, opens the auction by announcing uh, some suggested uh, opening bid. We sometimes call it starting price, sometimes call it reserve price. Uh, well, it doesn't have to exist, but usually it is some positive uh, number, um, say $10,000, depending on the item auctioned. Well, then the auctioneer accepts increasingly higher bids from the floor, from the potential buyers who are competing with each other. Uh, well, <clears throat> the auctioneer usually determines the minimum increment of bids, uh, often raising it when bidding goes high. Well, I mean, for example, if it is an, 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 a painting from uh, Da Vinci, uh, well, then probably uh, the increments is not going to be like, you know, hundred dollars. All right. So uh, usually there are increments. Uh, but again, for simplicity, you can ignore the in increments, <clears throat> which we will. Well, who, who wins and how do you win the auction? Well, the highest bidder at any given time is considered to have the standing bid. All right. So the, the standing it is basically uh, uh, the, 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 the final price. All right. Well, if... <clears throat> If nobody re, uh, sort of increases this standing bid, either you can displace the standing bid by uh, sort of uh, uh, announcing a higher bid. Uh, but if nobody increases the standing bid, well, then the, the auction is going to uh, finish. So if no other competing bidder challenges the standing bid within some given time period, uh, usually it's, you know, uh, you know, a few moments or a few uh, minutes. It's not like hours or days, but obviously for some other auction environments, it can be hours or days maybe. Well, the standing bid becomes the winner. Again, if, if nobody challenges the standing bid and so if nobody increases it, well, the standing bid becomes the winner and the item is sold to the highest bidder at a price equal to uh, equal to that uh, high, that bid. All right. Well, so this is <clears throat> the uh, English auction. Well, I am not, however, going to analyze English auction. Why is that? Well, because it's an an, an extensive form game, right? Um, the the potential player, potential I mean, potential buyers are actually the players in this game, and they observe each other's sort of strategies. One guy, uh, for example. Uh, calls price say uh, one million dollar and then another calls it two million dollar and so everybody observes his or her actions right this is a perfect information game in a sense uh, however there is the sequential move uh, going on it's like so we, we really have to analyze the sub games etc etc so instead of looking at a complicated relatively more complicated game let's look at a simpler game and in fact, it is a simpler version of the English auction. Well, uh, I, I, I say this uh, a version uh, a bit vaguely because uh, they're not really the same game, obviously, as I will describe in a moment. But the thing is, they are 
uh, under some, some, some certain assumptions, they are strategically equivalent. The Nash equilibrium are the same. Uh, the SPME of this game is subgame perfect Nash equilibrium of the English auction uh, outcome equivalent to the Nash equilibrium of the Vic Vickery auction. I mean, th th there is definitely a, a strategic relation, strong relationship between these two auctions under some assumptions. Um, we are not going to prove this in this course. It's uh, a subject for more advanced courses. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I am not giving you the Vickery auction uh, uh, simply because it's easier or simpler to work with. Uh, but they are, as I said, uh, strategically equivalent. Well, uh, most of the times uh, I am not going to call it Vickery auction. Uh, most of the times I'm going to call it what's called a second price auction. And you'll see uh, why this name. Uh, well... Why second price auction? Well, or the Vickery auction. So it is a simple, a simpler uh, game. Uh, the bidders, the potential buyers, simultaneously and independently write their own bids on a piece of paper and then put those bids in an envelope. All right, so it's a simultaneous move. Everybody uh, writes a price, a potential price, or, or we call it bid, in a, in a piece of paper and submit it to the auctioneer. All right. Um, and then the auctioneer opens all the envelopes and uh, the highest bidder wins, all right? So let's say, uh, let's suppose for simplicity, there were two bidders, two buyers, and one guy bid uh, $5 million, the other bid $5 million uh, plus $1. And so the highest bidder wins the auction. Well, what is the price? Well, the price is the second highest bid. All right. So you do not pay uh, your bid if you won the auction. You pay the highest uh, losing bid. All right. So uh, equivalently, the second highest bid. Uh, so once again, another example, well, let's say there are 10 uh, buyers and, and buyer one uh, bid a dollar, buyer two bid two dollars, etc. Buyer eight bid eight dollars and buyer 10 bid ten dollars, let's suppose. And so the winner is going to be buyer 10 because his bid ten dollars is the highest. However, he's not going to pay ten dollars, he's going to pay uh, the, the, the highest losing bid. So who are the losing bids? Well, the guy who bid $1, $2 up until $9, these are all the losers, right? Because there's only one item that is sold in this auction. That's a, an important assumption. And so only the 10th guy win the auction. And so the other remaining, the first nine guys loses the auction. So what is the highest losing bid? Or the what is the second highest bid? Uh, means the same thing. Well, it's $9. So therefore, the winner, the 10th guy, only pays $9, all right? So, uh, kind of awkward, right? Why you don't pay what you bid while well, you pay what uh, the, uh, the second highest bid is. Uh, but trust me, they are strategically equivalent. Well, why it is simpler? Well, as I said, because it's a simultaneous move game, we don't really have to worry about sub games, okay? So, the question is, uh, how do we approach to these games and how do we analyze these games? Well, when we want to analyze these environments or these strategic environments, obviously there are, uh, we have to be a formal or sort of a clear about the description of the environment, right? Remember, a game has several properties like who the players are, what their strategies are, what their payoffs are, etc. So here we have to be clear about players. Who are they? Well, the players are the potential buyers, right? The guys who bid. Well, um, good. Well, what about their actions? Well, the actions or the strategies, uh, that's simple. They basically bid. So let's call it BI. This is the strategy of bidder I. He bids some number, right? Some number between zero and infinity. Well, obviously you can bid as high as you like. And obviously, you can't bid something negative. So these are the strategies, as, as simple as this. 
I already mentioned what the rules are, right? Everybody simultaneously and independently bids and the highest bidder wins, but pays only the second highest bid. All right, well then finally the payoffs. Well, kind of simple, right? Everybody, uh, if, if you lose, well then we assume that your payoff is going to be regardless of your bid. Well, given that with this bid you lost, your payoff is gonna be zero. Well, if you win, win with this bid BI, UI, BI, well then, okay, so how do we model this? Well, that's one simplification, obviously. We assume that the, the potential buyer has some valuation for the item that is auctioned, all right? So that, that painting has some value to you. Um, and, and so this is your willingness to pay, the maximum willingness to pay. You do not want to pay more than VI. So VI is just a number, all right? Uh, this is UI, the utility. VI is some number between zero and infinity, all right? And so it's your highest willingness to pay. Um, and then um, the thing is you win, uh, you bid BI, but remember you pay BJ where BJ is the second highest bid, okay? So you do not pay BI dollar, this is what you bid. So here, obviously, uh, because BI is winning, so winning means what? BI is greater than uh, BJ for all J equals to one N. All right, okay, good. So this is the payoffs, all right, as, as simple as this. Well, the question is, um, so here, this is a simultaneous move game, and so we can find the Nash equilibrium of this game, right? Nash equilibrium. All right, actually, let's do this for a very simple example. Uh, so example is here, there are two players, two uh, buyers, potential buyers, or we call them bidders, all right? And bidder one has a valuation $100, bidder two has a valuation uh, $90, okay? Let's suppose. Um, well, then the question is, what is the Nash equilibrium of this game? Hmm, well, actually there are many Nash equilibrium of this game. All right, uh, but the one that makes m the most sense is the one where uh, they both bid their uh, true values, meaning B1 equals 100 and B2 equals 90 is a Nash equilibrium of this game. All right, uh, well, why is that so? Well, here are the things, like suppose that your opponent, so Again, we're checking Nash equilibrium. So suppose you observe that your opponent bid $90. Are you going to regret from your bid 100? Well, not really, why? Well, you could bid higher than 100, but you could still win. And so, so in this case, the bidder won his utility with this bid 100 is equal to his valuation minus the price he pays, so it's $10. But imagine you bid something B1 where B1 is greater than 100. Would this change anything? No, because as long as B1 is higher than $90, you're gonna win. And when you win, your payoff is not your bid minus the second uh, highest bid, but it's your valuation, which is fixed, right? Your willingness to pay is something that doesn't change it's fixed before the game and after the game, all right? So this is what we assume in economics. And so it's gonna be 100 minus 90, again 10. So as long as you bid higher than 100, you're gonna get the same payoff. As long as you bid higher than 90, but less than 100, all right? For example, you could bid 95, 92. Would this change your payoff? No, not really. Once again, you would win and then this would be your payoff. But the question is, what if you bid something less than $90, all right? Well, you may ask what happens if they both bid $90?
It is irrelevant, trust me, but if you like to be clear about it, let's suppose that when two guys bid exactly the same amount, well then the auctioneer tosses a fair coin with one half probability it's gonna come up head, with one half probability it's gonna come up tail, and if it is head, uh, buyer one wins, or the auction, uh, per, you know, uh, person one wins, if it is tail, person two wins. All right, so therefore, if two guys bid exactly the same number, it's going to be you know half enough probability to win the object and to lose the object. But obviously, this is a zero probability event because if you can bid any number between zero to infinity, right? You could bid anything. So two guys can bid anything between zero and infinity. What is the likelihood that both are going to pick exactly the same location? out of infinitely many possibilities, well, it's a zero possibility event. For that reason, it really doesn't matter. Um, but as I said, just for uh, completeness, I, 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 we can assume that uh, they, they will get uh, with equal probabilities. So the question is, what happens, I ignore what happens when B1 is equal to 90 for that reason, what if it is less than 90? So what if you bid something less than $90? Well, this time you're going to lose because if you bid, for example, $80 or 90, uh, I'm sorry, $89, you're going to lose this auction. And so your payoff will be automatically zero. All right. So for that reason, um, as you see, bidding 100 is one of the best responses. There are many others, for example, bidding 2,000 is also best response. Bidding $91 is also best response. But, but bidding $100 is a best response, is a best response to the second player's uh, strategy. All right, so the first guy is best responding the second guy. Well, the question is, is, is the second guy best responding the first guy? Well, let's check. Well, given that the first guy is bidding $100, um, for the second guy, can he, uh, I mean, if the second guy bids something less than $100, we know that he is going to lose, right? Whether it's $99 or $0, it doesn't matter. The, the, the second guy is going to lose and he's going to get zero payoff, which is what he's achieving when he bids $90. So there is no improvement. There is no profitable deviation here profitable deviation to some B2 less than 100. But what if B2 to more than 100, all right? I mean, what if player two bids something higher than $100? So is there any profitable deviation there? I mean, 101, 2000, it really doesn't matter because why B2 greater than 100? Because this is the case which ensures that the second guy will be the winner. Well, if he is the winner, all right, what's going to happen is the following. Well, with this bid higher than $100, you're going to win the object. And in this case, your payoff is your valuation. Remember, what was your maximum willingness to pay? Well, it was $90. So you, your willingness to pay is not $100, it's $90. So 90 minus, what is the losing bid? Well, remember you bid higher than $100. So there are two bids, B2, which is higher than 100, and B1, which is 100. So what is the second highest bid or what is the highest uh, losing bid? Well, it's 100. So you're going to pay $100. So what's your payoff? It's minus 10, which is less than zero, which is what you achieve when you bid 90 and lose this auction. So what does that mean? That means given that the first guy is bidding $100, the second guy's bidding $90 is one of the best responses. Obviously, bidding zero is also best response, right? Bidding $5 is also best response, but I don't care other best responses. All I care is $90 is a best response, $200. So therefore, both guys, both buyers are best responding one another. And hence, this strategy profile is in fact an Ash equilibrium. All right, so <clears throat> what do we learn from this very simple analysis? Uh, well, uh, many things. One of them, well, first of all, in a, a, a 
a decree auction or second price auction or equivalently in the English auction, you shouldn't bid higher than your valuation, all right? So if you think that this picture, this painting, whatever the, uh, the item that is auctioned, if you think it's, it's not worth more than $10,000 or if this is your max budget, well, you should not bid higher than this, okay? Well, what is the second thing that we learn? Well, every bidder bidding his or her true value is actually a Nash equilibrium, all right? So basically, you don't really make any strategic thinking. It's like, should I bid $5 less than my maximum willingness to pay $2 less or, you know, 10% less more? You don't really need to make this strategic uh, thinking in this game because um, we didn't show that. Uh, in fact, here, <clears throat> bidding the true values is a dominant strategy. If you, if you apply iterated elimination of weakly dominated strategies, you'll see that actually uh, bidding the true values are uh, sort of a, a weakly dominant strategy in this game. And it's a Nash equilibrium, so you don't really have to worry about uh, the strategic interaction here. Well, so, but obviously this is not the game that I am intended to uh, sort of explain. Why? Well, because we want to do something new here. We would like to talk about incomplete information game. If you remember, we talked about perfect versus imperfect games, right? Well, they were games where um, there's a simultaneity of moves. And obviously, uh, the, uh, the second price auction is an imperfect information game. When you choose your strategy, you're, you don't know your opponent's strategy, you can't observe it. And so it's imperfect information game. Um, however, chess is a perfect information game. But on top of that, we would like to do something new, incomplete. So some parts of the information is incomplete. So we are actually relaxing some of our assumptions in game theory. What is this? Well, here, I mean, let's consider, we consider this very simple example. In real life, if this is really the case, I mean, in, in, think about it, an auction environment in real life. You probably do observe how many potential buyers are there in the auction house, right? Some of them are in, uh, on, 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 on a phone, which are basically talking to the buyer who would like to be anonymous. Um, and some are present there, basically raising some card uh, to indicate that they would like to increase the price. And so the potential buyers are all in the same location, right? So the number of buyers are there. So the players, I mean, there's a perfect information or complete information about players. So who the players are, etc. Strategies. Well, again, uh, this is exactly why I didn't want to talk about auction, uh, English auction, because their strategies are more complicated. You know, when I should bid, you know, in which increment I should bid, and when should I stop bidding, etc. So the, the strategies are sort of a multi-dimensional, and so it's more complicated. For that reason, I, I wanted to study second price auction. So here, the strategies are very simple. I am just going to write a number on a piece of paper, and that's it. Um, so in terms of, you know, I mean, that the strategies that everybody is willing to bid some number between zero to infinity, well, I mean, it's a common knowledge, it's a common information, right? Uh, uh, so therefore, the strategies are sort of a complete information in this game. Well, what about the payoffs? Hmm. So question is here, in fact, not whether you get zero versus this, the rules are clear, right? Uh, the rules are such that if you win, you are going to pay uh, the second losing bid. And so this functional form is an assumption that we made. And if you lose, you're going to get zero payoff. Well, maybe if you lose, you're going to suffer an, an incredibly because you're going to feel terrible for, I don't know, not having this, this, this particular painting. I mean, yeah, there, there might be some room of improvement there. But what is the most important or I think... Uh, most relevant extension is that in reality we usually do not know what VI is for each player 
in the game, right? I mean, think of like this very two, a very simple example to potential buyers. So as a buyer, you probably know how much you're willing to pay for this painting. Let's say you're buyer one. So what is willingness to pay? Well, this idea comes from, you know, you, you heard about it in intermediate microeconomics, in uh, advanced microeconomic theory. So it's basically what derives the demand curve, right? So it is about your preferences, it is about your income, your wealth, etc. So I'm not going to give sort of a detailed discussion about what derives valuation, but what we assume in economics is that everybody, you know, when they come to a market environment, so sort of a, to trade something, well, they, they come with some uh, clear picture of how much, the maximum, how much they are willing to pay for this item, all right? In real life, you may be unsure about it, right? Because, for example, if it is a painting, you actually do not want to hold it for a long time. You want to resell it. And so the resale price is what determines your willingness to pay. So, that you know, things are more complicated in real life, I know. But we usually assume that everybody knows his willingness to pay because everybody is fully aware of his preferences and his income and wealth. All right, so that's sort of an assumption we don't really want to play too much. Um, but what we can extend or, or relax, what assumption that we relax is what I know about my opponent's willingness to pay. So here, for example, we assumed that as player one, buyer one, I know that I would like to pay $100, but I also know that my opponent is actually willing to pay $90, which is less than what I want. And so strategically, that makes me sort of advantaged. Why? Well, because I would like to pay more than what this guy wants to pay. All right, so uh, let me bid $100. So I know that he's not gonna go above 100 because his willingness to pay is definitely less than 100. So he's gonna make loss which he doesn't want to, because by losing the object, he could ensure zero payoff anyway, all right? So for that reason, we can extend this idea. Well, what if players do not know their opponent's payoffs for sure? So in that sense, there is some incomplete information, all right? Um, sometimes we call this, by the way, asymmetric information. Well, why asymmetric? Well, because everybody knows his or her valuation, uh, but unsure about his opponent's valuation, all right? So player one knows that he wants to pay $100, but he is probably unsure about how much his opponent wants to pay. And symmetrically, player two knows that he's, uh, he wants to play $90 tops, but he is probably unsure about how much his opponent, buyer one, is willing to pay, all right? So, the next question is, how are we going to model this environment? And then, how are we going to solve this environment? Okay, so let's think of the, again, the simplest environment where there are two players or two bidders or two potential buyers, and they would like to bid for this non-divisible good, the painting. Uh, here, the assumption non-divisibility is important because it means if somebody wins, that means the other guys are going to lose because the good is not divisible. They cannot share it, all right? Well, so let's assume that the first guy has a valuation 100, the second guy has a valuation 90. So we call this, but this time, uh, private information. Why? Well, because the first guy, although he knows how much he's willing to pay, he's unsure about his opponent's willingness to pay. And same for player two. Although he knows his willingness to pay, unsure, he's unsure about how much his opponent is willing, uh, willing to pay. So how can we model this? Well, obviously we do not want to say, well, the buyers are unsure about uh, their opponent's willingness to pay. We have to be, we want to be more formal about it. And so the one way to formally describe the beliefs is, uh, you can say, for example, buyer one believes that his opponent's willingness to pay, which is V2, the parameter, is actually randomly distributed according to some cumulative distribution function F2 on the interval zero infinity, all right? So basically that means buyer one thinks anything is possible, 
but the thing is, you know, according to this probability distribution, for example, if it is a uniform, maybe uh, sort of, a, sort of the, the, the distribution of this V2 is uniform. But if it is a normal, well, that means uh, sort of uh, it's more likely to be around the mean of this normal distribution. But, you know, nevertheless, anything is possible. All right. So symmetrically, you can think that the buyer too believes that the, the, the first buyer's willingness to pay is random. And so the V1 parameter is randomly distributed according to some probability distribution function F1 on zero infinity interval. All right. So here, obviously, one thing is important. Remember in our earlier discussions of game theory is like uh, the players, the set of players, set of strategies and their payoffs, all this information is common knowledge. So here we are um, sort of extending this uh, or sort of relaxing this assumption. So uh, some you know, things are not complete information. There's some incomplete information in the sense that player one is unsure about the second player's uh, sort of private information. Um, so, but nevertheless, um, you know, can we still, do we still keep this idea of common knowledge assumption? Yes. How so? Well, here, I mean, we are not going to argue this too much in this course because it really deserves, uh, I mean, requires some advanced um, training in game theory. But we are going to assume that those probability distributions are common knowledge. So what does that mean? That means the following. If buyer one thinks that his opponent's uh, valuation is distributed, normally distributed, with mean, for example, mu and the standard deviation sigma, all right? Well, then player, so this is player one's belief, but then player two will also be aware, fully aware, that player one is in fact believing that his valuation is distributed in this range, although his valuation is exactly 90, all right? So whatever mu is. Um, so, so that probability, these probability distributions are common knowledge. This is what we assume. Again, what happens if these are not common knowledge? Well, again, the, the, this is not the discussion for this level. Uh, it, it, it requires a much more uh, advanced uh, skills in game theory. All right, let's consider a simpler case, right? I mean, it doesn't really have to be like, well, anything is possible according to some continuous uh, cumulative distribution function. Well, in fact, for most of our examples, we are going to look at simpler environments where you know, one of three things can happen or one of two things can happen type of environments. So you can imagine, for example, buyer one believes that the buyer two's valuation is in fact uh, distributed according to, uh, sort of equally, so it's a uniform distribution, but the potential values are 110, 190. And symmetrically, buyer two believes that the buyer one's valuation is 110, 100, or 90. All right? So... As player one, I know my valuation is 100. Uh, I know that I believe that my opponent can actually beat me, meaning his valuation can be $110 with one third probability. His valuation can be 100, so we can actually be in a tie. And his valuation can actually be 90. Hmm, so the question is, as, by the way, everything is symmetric for player two. So here, remember, when this information wasn't private but public, meaning the, the previous example we analyzed where the valuation for buyer one and two are, are known by everyone. Well, in this case, buyer one knew that he has the advantage because he knows that his opponent cannot overbid him. No way, because uh, otherwise his opponent is going to get negative payoff. But he, so therefore, he was kind of relaxed saying, well, whether I bid $100 or $95 or $91, I'm going to win this auction anyway. Right, remember? So he was kind of relaxed. However, now he can't be so relaxed because he knows that if he bids, for example, $91, he can actually lose it in, in these two, I mean, strictly, I mean, definitely lose it if his opponent is under these two scenarios, right? He may, I mean, because 
uh, it doesn't, I mean, we don't know whether those guys, meaning, uh, let me put it this way, we don't know if the buyer with a value 110 or buyer value 100 are going to bid exactly their valuations or maybe less or maybe more. But what I want to show is that the buyer one with the valuation 100 is not going to be relaxed about saying whether 90 or 91 or 95 or 99, I'm going to win this object. So I'm kind of uh, sort of, okay, I'm, I'm cool about bidding 100. So this time it's not so easy. You see what I mean? So therefore the, the calculations must be more careful, obviously. But the, so, so maybe the equilibrium strategies will, will be different. This is what I would like to say. Um, well, how different, or the, the real question is, how do we analyze this environment anyhow, right? In, even in this very simple environment. So what, how are we gonna approach this environment? Well, very simple. What we're gonna do, we're gonna find, um, uh, let me erase this. What we're gonna do, we are going to find Nash equilibrium, all right? So we're going to find the Nash equilibrium of this game. Um, so we know the definition of Nash equilibrium. Every player best responds his opponent. However, there's a trick that we're going to use here. What is this trick? Well, here, the strategy profile, is it, is it B1 and B2 only? Is this the strategy profile really? Hmm. Well, you may say, yes, it is the strategy profile because there are two players, remember? Yes, there are two players. And so for each player, there should be a strategy. Hmm. I mean, agree, but the problem is, let's, let's look at player one. So player one, uh, things that his opponent can have, this guy with a valuation 110, or this guy with a valuation 100, or this guy with a valuation 90. Question is, when I say B2, doesn't it imply that I, I, I sort of believe that my opponent is going to bid exactly the same amount of money regardless of his valuation? Yeah, because remember here, B1 is my strategy, B2 is my opponent's strategy. Why do I do this? Well, remember the Nash, given a strategy profile, every player takes his opponent's strategy fixed and see if he is best responding it or not, right? So therefore I'm gonna fix B2 and check if B1 is the best response. But for this, I need to know what B2 is and what B2 implies in this environment, all right? So B2 is just a number like 100, 90, 95, thousand, zero, but B2, a single B2 for player two means um, even though my opponent valuation, true valuation is 110, well, his, his true valuation is 90, I, I, I can hear, but I don't know that in this game. Remember, this is a private info game or asymmetric info game or incomplete info game, meaning I just know my valuation and I just believe that my opponent can be 110 guy or 100 guy or 90 guy, but I'm not really sure which one is he. And I can't see his type, his, his valuation before I make a decision. So that's the problem. I have to make a decision without observing uh, his, 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 his true valuation. So in sort of simultaneous move game, there are two types of uncertainty. One, I'm going to choose my action without knowing my opponent's action. So that's always the there, right? And the second type of uncertainty that we are in, in, in incorporating now is I am going to choose my strategy without knowing, uh, you know, who my opponent really is. Is it really the 110 guy or is it the 90 guy? So I need to make my strategy choice before knowing his true valuation or true type. You see what I mean? So again, if I assume that my opponent's strategy is B2, that automatically, directly, indirectly implies that all these three potential uh, opponents of mine are going to bid exactly the same number. But this is unrealistic, right? I mean, 
the 110 guy who could actually may actually prefer to bid higher than $100, for example, and where the 90 guy actually doesn't probably prefer to bid $100 because if he wins, he's going to make a negative profit. Of course, if he, if he, if he loses, he's going to make zero profit, but if he wins, he may make a negative profit. So therefore, this is a strong assumption. Well, then what am I going to do? Well, why not say b21, b22, b23? What does that mean? That means I'm going to fix, as player one, I'm going to fix my opponent's strategy. But if he is really 110 guy, he may choose a strategy different than his strategy if he is in fact 100 guy. And that also may be different than his strategy if he in fact 90 guy. So therefore, for every potential type, right? So these are types of my opponents. Type 1, type 2, type 3, or you call it type 110, type 100, type 90, as you wish. But we call those as types. So for each type of my opponent, I should assign, I mean, this is the safest thing. I should assign potentially a different strategy. Because again, assigning the same strategy for all the types is very restrictive. Because again, it's a 110 guy and 90 guy. I, I shouldn't be expect, expecting them both bidding the same number. It's, it's irrelevant, right? I mean, here, for example, when I was 100 and the other guy was 90, and that was common knowledge, well, we know that I would bid higher than his bid. But now, I mean, why 110 guy and 90 guy are, are supposed to bid the same amount? So, therefore, I should assign different strategy for different types. Well, and then I should see if I'm best responding these three. Huh, but are there, I mean, okay, what the heck is going on? Are there three opponents for me? No, not really. There's in fact just one guy there. It's the buyer too. But the thing is with one third probability, he can be type one. With one third probability, he can be type two. And with one third probability, he can be type three. So these are the probabilities of types of types all right so therefore what i should be doing is like calculating my expected utility well what is my expected utility if i bid b1 is going to be obviously my expected utility i bid b1 my opponent bids b2 1 but this is one third probability plus with one third probability, right? This is kind of a lottery now. With one third probability, my opponent is going to be this type, so the second type, and so he's going to play this strategy, and therefore the outcome is going to be different for me. B1, B2, 2, plus one third expected utility, or just utility. Uh, yeah, let's call them utility because these are not expected. Uh, this one is expected. So the utility uh, that I bid B1, my opponent b b2 3. well you may say why don't you bid different numbers for each different types look i can't do that because i can't observe my opponent's uh type right is it 110 guy 100 guy 90 guy and so therefore i cannot condition my strategy uh on uh, my opponent's type. I can't say I'm going to bid this money if my opponent's type is that. I'm going to bid that if my opponent's type is this. I can't really do that because I can't observe my opponent's type. So therefore, I'm going to choose one bid, B1, and the thing is, it may lead to three different outcomes. Why? Well, because there are three potential types, different types of my opponent, and they all may or may not, I don't know that, uh, follow different strategies. And so therefore I may achieve different payoffs and different outcomes in each three, each of these three cases. All right. So 
This is how I should say, well, you know what? Uh, the expected utility of B1 is the best response if it basically maximizing, I mean, the B1 is maximizing this. So if you change B1 to B1 prime, well, the thing is uh, you're going to calculate the expected utility in exactly the same way instead of B1. So instead of, for example, 100, it's going to be 99. Instead of uh, maybe if B1 is, is zero, so you're going to insert zero here, but nevertheless, the expected utility will be calculated according to this. So, uh, one thing, let's come back here. I said, if we are thinking of a strategy profile, then we should be thinking of three different strategy for dif three different types of player two. But you know what? This is the perspective when we'll look at this game from, uh, from the point of view of player one. What if we'll look at this game from the point of view of player two? Well, he also doesn't know the, uh, his opponent's type, the player one. So therefore, player two is going to assume, well, maybe it is the first type or the second type or the third type, I don't know, but each may have a different strategy. And so therefore, the second guy is going to take, fix those three strategies. And so, if we are talking about Nash equilibrium of this game, you know what? The strategy profile shouldn't be as simple like B1, B2. Well, it should be a bit more complicated than this. How so? Well, we just derived that it should be B11, B12, B13, comma, B21, B22, B23. So these are strategies for player one. These are strategies for player two. So yes, there are still two players, but now a strategy profile is not a tuple, B1, B2. It's, uh, uh, it is, it's a vector with six component. Why? Well, because for each type, we assign a strategy. And I just explain the intuition or the reasoning behind this. All right. So let me finish by giving you a bit more um, sort of intuition about what the heck we are doing here. Uh, once again, although there are two players, we cannot simply say B1, B2 is a strategy profile and hence Nash and hence whatever, because Assuming something like this, I mean, assuming this format sort of forces us to assume that all types of different players have to play the same strategy. But this is too restrictive. This doesn't have to be the case. If buyer one is in fact 110 guy, he is going to, or he may prefer to bid higher than uh, the buyer if he is type 90. So therefore, you have to use a different strategy, potentially different. They don't have to be different. Maybe they will be in equilibrium, maybe they will be the same, but potentially different strategies for each type. All right, and then you should look at the Nash equilibrium of this profile. How do I do that? Well, simple. So once you sort of construct the strategy profile, all you have to do, just assume or imagine that there are six players, all right? I'm not going to call them really players. I'm going to call them uh, as such, type one of player one, type two of player one, type three of player one, and then type one of player two, type two of player two, and then finally type three of player two. All right, so again, in, once I construct this strategy profile, just imagine that there are six players, and so just find the Nash equilibrium um, or for those six players. All right. You know the payoffs for each player, right? For example, if this if this is the player of I mean uh, type one uh, of player two, well then we know his payoff. 
If he loses, he's going to get zero payoff. If he wins, his payoff is going to be 110 minus the uh, losing bid, the highest losing bid, right? So we know the payoffs of all these players. We know the strategies. And then checking Nash equilibrium is very simple. Fix all the other. So what you have to do, fix all other players and types strategy. Meaning, if you want to check whether B11 is a best response or not, you have to fix all those five strategies. Why? Well, look, first of all, these three strategies belong to the second player, right? And so I cannot play with them. I cannot change it. So I have to take it as given. What about these two strategies? These two strategies, in fact, belong to player one. Well, yes, but these are different types of player one. Um, by the way, I don't know if it makes sense, but I usually consider this as follows. So uh, when we have incomplete information, we actually look at environments where the players are um, having multi-personality uh, kind of. So this guy, player one, has three personality. Player two has three personality, all right? So multiple personality disorder, they call it. Uh, I'm not going to call it a disorder. So let's say player one and th two can be three different guys. Uh, the thing is, uh, when you interact with your opponent, you're not sure whether you're interacting with one type or the other. I, it's just, you know, that guy, but I can't really d d d distinguish him, his, his type, because, uh, you know, I, I can't gather this information. What is your evaluation? Obviously, th this guy is not going to answer this question truthfully. Um, so therefore, uh, symmetrically, obviously, I may be interacting with this guy because I am type one. I know that my type, but the thing is the other guy may actually be thinking that I am type two, all right? And type two may actually, so if I have a multiple personality, we may actually do completely different and crazy things and we may not be aware of each other's actions. So therefore, I'm not going to treat my other types as myself because I can't really control them. Uh, they're uncontrollable for me and hence I am going to take them as if they belong to another player and another person, all right? So, because it's a different personality. So, that's the thing. So, if you're checking B11 best response to others strategy, you have to fix all those five strategies. Obviously, the same for B12. If you want to check if B12 is the best response, you have to fix all the other, so all those four and this strategy. All right? So, that means if there's an incomplete information, the Nash equilibrium that we're going to do is just standard Nash equilibrium, but the idea of strategy profile is extended to types. All right, well, the thing is, we're not going to call this approach Nash equilibrium because that wasn't uh, the Nash, uh, John Nash's uh, original idea. Uh, we call this Bayesian Nash equilibrium. But you got the idea. The principle is the same. Just finding the Nash of some strategy of, of some game. But the idea of creating the strategy profile is new because there's additional uncertainty we should incorporate. And for that reason, we call it Bayesian Nash equilibrium. All right. So in the next episode, I'm going to formalize all the things I mentioned in this episode.